The next wave, and we're starting to already see it spill over into coins, is not so much related to the market in general. It's related to how much money is sloshing around in Bitcoin and Ethereum that won't come back. And it's saying, listen, even if I sell 2% of my Bitcoin here because it's back at all-time highs and I I rode the drawdown to 18,000, I'm not bringing it back. So I'll speculate in some, some coins, right, with my profit that I'm not paying taxes on. This episode of Trends with Friends is brought to you by Freck. I believe in this product so much that I moved most of my passive stock market investing assets over. If you are like most of us that invest in ETFs, you should know that there is a better way that lets you invest in an index like the S&P 500 while saving thousands on your taxes. It's called Freck Direct Indexing and takes zero additional effort. Just as easy as investing in an ETF, Freck Direct Indexing can help you earn more by unlocking tax savings through tax loss harvesting. Direct indexing has been around for decades, but only through wealth advisors at high fees and high minimums. Technological innovation has changed that and made it available directly to investors like yourself. Direct indexing is now growing faster than mutual funds and ETFs. Join the thousands switching to get more bang for your buck. Visit freck.com. That's F-R-E-C.com to get started. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Trends with Friends. Uh, Phil, JC, and I are excited today to be talking about the explosion, all-time highs in Bitcoin. Uh, In celebration and in honor of uh, support of Trends with Friends, we're giving away a MacBook Pro to one lucky listener. Find out how to win in the show description. All right, boys. So it's three amigos. Phil, you're going to lead us on the topics? Okay, so I'm going to... I'm going to try to add some semblance of order to the insanity that we're going on. So we're going to start with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's making an all-time high right now. It's up like 60% since February 1st or something like that. Um, It comes back all the time. It's a resilient asset. And we'll talk about that. But the first place I'd like to go is to JC. To give us like, what's going on with Bitcoin? What's the technical picture? Uh, what are you seeing here? Mazel tov Bitcoin. You know, I wrote a blog post about it today for you, Phil. You're going you're gonna to lead the, the show today because this is all crypto. Uh, there's a lot going on, right? There's, there's an eerie feeling too as Apple, Tesla break down, um, bonds, you know, still in their longest bear market. JC will lead, but, you know, um, it was a fake breakout, right? JC, it dipped to like 23,000. Although and, the trade was to buy it above 31. Yeah, yeah. It took a so while. They it broke out while. above 31. JC has now mortgaged his house and can afford the good gel. Is that the, is that the point? You're going to afford the good gel. You know, it's one of those times where, you know, the upside is so much. And, the, and most importantly, in my opinion, the risk is so well defined. It's the combination of both of those that really attracted me to that particular trade. Right. You know, there's all I love a trade that is very well defined risk. You know where you're out, you know where you're wrong. That's great. But then on the other side of the coin, you literally have unlimited upside. So you have well defined risk and unlimited upside. Holy shit. Do I love I love the sound of that. So yeah. that's why th- this particular um, you know, trade and asset class, whatever you want to call it, has interested me so much. I mean, I own a freaking crypto punk. I'm up like a hundred grand, like in a month or something like that on my punk. Like Life is we great. talked about the punk. <laughs> I punked myself. We talked about it right there with ETH at around 2K. You and, and me punks. at dinner at that bougie steakhouse. Remember we were eating the Wagyu? Yeah, and we talked great. about it on the show. All right. So, Phil, sorry. JC, take it away with like the, the high end. J- Phil, you want him to go through? It's perfect. Yeah, this, this chart. I mean, it's just beautiful here. It's got this chart. It's a seven-year, eight-year chart. Go got ahead. the new all-time high candle. Here you can see Bitcoin with the uh, IBIT trust. So first completed monthly candlestick for the IBIT, by the way there, Pearl Dog. So uh, new all-time highs, of course, for the IBIT. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, listen, for me, the way I look at it, I look at it from a supply and demand standpoint. The trade was you buy it above 31, the target's the new all-time highs. We pre- probably ripped through that. Go to 100, you get the $100 roll, and then you get that spillover into 110, 115, and then you'll get a correction from there. That has 
that has always been sort of my vision. But as I've learned over the years, the market doesn't give a damn what JC's vision is. Uh, it's very convenient for it to work out that way. But that's sort of where my head has been at. Now, the question is, when we get to those all-time highs, how is the market going to react to those levels? We know there's an overwhelming amount of supply relative to the demand in prior circumstances up here. So the question is, what's going to uh, you know move the supply and demand? You've got the happening coming up, which I don't think is that big of a deal because you got 93% of all the Bitcoin ever has already been mined. So you only got 7% left. So the miners are selling you know, they're not selling that much and now they're going to sell half. Like, yeah, I guess that's not bearish that there's, you know, half the supply. But how bullish really is it is really my question. Like, we know it's not bearish, less supply. Great. But how bullish is it? Eh, I don't know. For me, the more, uh, the bigger side of the equation is on the demand side, which is from these ETFs that are coming in that was not available in the prior uh, experiences at these prices in the 60,000s. They did not exist. So you now have like this, this massive window of potential demand that obviously is coming in, right? So it's not like, hmm, I wonder if the demand's going to come in. No, no, no. We know it's at unprecedented levels. You know, the volume in these Bitcoin ETFs is more than SPY or QQQ, which is fucking crazy. And these things haven't even started trading options yet. Like, holy shit. So yes, the happening, terrific. It's not a bad thing. But I think the bigger side is on the demand side that was not present last time that we were here. So I, I, I think that there's going to be some supply here. And I think we're already seeing it as we're shooting this. But I think there's going to be some supply here. And the question is, how long does it take to break through 70? You know, to me, 70, if we're above 70, it's another mortgage to house sort of opportunity, in my opinion. Below 70, it's messy short term. I think ultimately we do break above 70. I think you, I think you go ham. I think, you know, you got another 50, you know, 40, 50% of upside. You know, I think, you know, we'll see, but we'll see how long it takes. To your point about the demand side, uh, Matt Hogan was out this earlier this week. He's the founder, uh, CEO of Bitwise. They have one of those ETFs. They're doing, it's doing incredible. And he was just commenting on the demand that he's seeing coming in. And it's like all of a sudden, all the boomers, you know, that don't know how to use a wallet, they don't need a wallet anymore. All they need is a Fidelity account or a Schwab account, and they can just go in, they can go into retirement accounts and just pick one of these tickers and buy an ETF. Not to mention all these- Bitcoin. Not to mention all these other large institutions that are really moving the needle here. I mean, you know, yes, the mom and pops, terrific. But again, I don't even think it's that. I think it's from an institutional level, participants that just because of their mandate have not been able to participate in this in this market because they just can't. Right. Now they can. That's the that's the real one. Okay, so so Phil, Phil, can you and I talk about behavioral and what I'm saying, or where did you want to go next? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. go, go, go. We're, here's we're, a phenomenon. We're, beautiful. we're so beautiful. Let me flesh this out amongst my pals here. And obviously, I, I want to get some other crypto people over the next year because I think what we're seeing, you know, we call I call it the degenerate economy. The ETFs is not part of the degenerate economy. That's more part of old world meeting new world, right? Bitcoin is just an on-ramp to this degenerate digital economy, right? Which is you may which is what's good for ETF for Bitcoin will eventually be good for shit coins, right? And let me explain, not not good for everybody, but the limited supply of Bitcoin is a feature. As that money moves to shit coins through stable coins and as people live in a digital world, meaning enough people now have made so much money in Bitcoin that it ain't coming back for tax reasons, for, for reasons that they don't need. So now we have enough capital, finally, and enough confidence in Bitcoin itself that the money that was there for a decade, 2011, that were holdlers, they're not coming back, right? Because they know the institutions are parked on the other side. So their only question is, do we sell some Bitcoin move it to Ethereum, Solana, make other bets, but it ain't coming back to the fiat world. So this is another huge development. One of the huge developments was in 2017 on StockTwits when Bitcoin BTC.x messages surpassed SPY messages. That was a phenomenal moment. Yeah, it was six years after Bitcoin started. And yeah, it doesn't prove much, but it proved that the StockTwits crowd, which is just a little bit further behind than 
the early adopters were taking, were willing, were spending more time thinking about Bitcoin than the S&P. That was a major moment in the next wave. Today's wave is about what we're seeing with institutions, ETFs. The next wave, and we're starting to already see it spill over into coins, is not so much related to the market in general. It's related to how much money is sloshing around in Bitcoin and Ethereum that won't come back and is saying, listen, even if I sell 2% of my Bitcoin here because it's back at all-time highs and I, I rode the drawdown to 18,000, uh, I'm not bringing it back. So I'll speculate in some, some coins right, with my profit that I'm not paying taxes on, potentially. So now you're seeing this spill over into good assets, which are crypto punks, in my opinion, because they're a pure NFT, they're pure art. And into shitty assets, like you're seeing with people are going to get fucked. The only cap on this inflation that's happening in the digital world is the fact that people are going to get fucked in limited, limitless supply shit coins. So that is the one interesting $16 million punk sold yesterday. Okay, uh, that's the second highest ever. That's not going to zero, but it may not triple again, meaning the certain assets like punk are going to be overpaid for during this next boom. And certain new assets will appear, but there will be 99% of the assets that show up will have limitless supply and fuck most people. So you're still going to have this other economy going on where stupid investing happens, but the smart investors are not coming back. There is now another world that will fund the Solana phone or some other phone that allows you to partake in this digital world 24-7. Right, Solana already has two versions of their phone out by version five with the Android phone. They're going to get it right, and you're all we're all going to have gambling money, um, speculative money, uh, tr international travel money on this phone that's not trackable. That will have our maps not trackable through Hive Mapper. We'll have our mobile through Helium. No one will know where we are spending that money. Nobody in the old world will, and that's the world that probably. This bubble gave us, finally. This bubble finally gave us an alternate universe for actual real spending of dollars. Let me, let me In, show you the other side of this bubble <clears throat> and uh, what, what, yeah, I, this, think, uh, look at the what I think is on, popping look, it. Here, look, yeah, go ahead. Go look ahead. at this. Pearl Dog, this is right up your alley. So this comes from the Bank of America Fund Manager Survey, and they are... Um, you know, talking to all their portfolio managers and asking them a whole series of questions. So the answers there uh, are really informative in terms of the positioning and the mentality of a lot of these buy side uh, decision makers. And when asked um, how many of them are expecting higher inflation, uh, there are virtually none of them are expecting higher inflation. And when asked how many are expecting short term rates to increase, uh, none of them are expecting short term rates to increase. These are the fund managers that traditionally, when at consensus, uh, are historically incredibly mispositioned. So the unwinds of these positionings can impact markets greatly. And if these guys that are historically very wrong at turning points are in fact wrong again, then expect higher short-term rates and higher inflation. And it just so happens that what you're seeing is new three, four-month highs in Inflation protected treasuries relative to nominal yielding treasuries. So, in other words, the bond market pricing in higher inflation. Crude oil prices were up both in January and February, which has not been happening when the stock market is up, right? So, while the indexes were up, oil was up both of those months, which has been happening when stocks are under pressure. So, essentially, you know, crude oil front running further selling in the stock market as those inflationary pressures continue to rise, the expectations for lower rates, right? This is a rally that's driven on expectations for lower rates, but the exact opposite is what's happening here. And the bond market pricing in higher interest rates. And then when you look at 10-year break-evens and you look at the crude oil chart, they look exactly the same. So crude oil is a very good representation of what the bond market is pricing in for um, for inflation, and you're seeing it already in the refining stocks. Um, you haven't quite seen it in the oil and gas, but if you start to see that rotation into the oil and gas stocks, 
you know, that's a huge sign because you're already seeing it in unleaded gasoline, in heating oil, and crude oil. They've been ripping since December, despite the U.S. stock market indexes going up. So I'd be looking very closely at that as what's going to unwind this, you know, AI, you know, what's going to correct this market. And by the way, we analyze the sentiment. Sentiment is stretched very optimistically. So, you know, some, some people need a, a kick in the teeth, if you will, uh, to reset that sentiment a little. That's how I see it. What do you think, Pearl Doc? So let me, let me ask you this, JC. Can we, because of what Howard was saying before about like, this is a different pile of money. This is a pile of money that's not coming back in these speculative cryptos. You're seeing sort of like Bitcoin led the way. And this, there's a pattern recognition, Howard, there's a pattern recognition component to this. Like the guys that have been around crypto for a long time saw this happen the last time around. They saw Bitcoin rally like crazy. And then in the wake of that, all of these speculative, uh, all of these speculative assets just go crazy. Like the NFTs and the punks and the shit coins and cum rocket or whatever. And um, there really I know, is a that's, like, that's like the best one. Ever. Yeah. Like yeah. nobody's topping that one. Yeah. And, and uh, are you so a cum my rocket you, whale? Jason, are you a cum rocket that? whale? Are you a cum rocket whale? Like, do you I'm have a cum enough rocket of the whale. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what she said. That's the new Uranus. <laughs> so hang on. So, Bill, but I would also say the smart money, truly the smart money, they've been long bravo. I've got links, you know, Fred Wilson, 2011, Yoni Asia, 2011. We'll pull them up later. But these are people that have not wavered. They're, I only follow a couple people on crypto, right? You can follow. They... Of course, I'm sure have sold. Maybe they're not. Maybe they've been buyers. The point is the people that believed after them, the people that did the work, the people that hoarded these things, they've had four or five scares already. I'm talking 70, 80 percent drawdowns. OK, they are wiser, meaning they either have flipped out into stronger hands or they are never selling. Right. And even if they're never selling, they'll sell a little. And now because the stable coins can dribble it out into further uh, ecosystem but hold on, development. But hold on, Howard. Hold on. We have to put things in perspective because mm -hmm. these crypto markets are so tiny, it's irrelevant, right? So let's let's keep that in mind. I'm not saying, with perspective. They're, I'm not saying they're hold on, relevant. Hold on, hold on, hold on. They, what I'm saying is the amount of money that's invested in, in crypto assets versus what the bond market is doing is is naughty right so let's i know you know that and pearl but like i don't know if everybody in the audience is kind of aware because it's easy to get lost and like oh my god a trillion dollars like the bond market is 130 that's trillion my point dollars, the right? bond so market let's let's remember what's moving what's moving and shaking uh we'll get all there. These we'll get there. what i'm saying is that's what makes this the eeriest thing i've ever seen because the bond market continues in a bear market longest ever right banks are Small banks are getting crushed still with higher rates. The Fed is screwed because how, with all the speculation, how can they cut rates, right? Um, which, but yet inflation is raging in crypto and still pe perking in the regular world. So, and the small banks are, are on the verge of cracking again and going to zero. So you have like a serious eerie moment which you started talking about a few weeks ago with the divergences. And now you're starting to see the gap downs, right? Tesla back at lows, Apple breaking down, Google breaking down. The, the podcasters will tell you, and we're podcasters, that this is Google Gemini's fault. You know, now they come back with all their analysis of why the markets are doing what they're doing. But the prices were, and the divergences were showing up, right? Now the news fits... Yeah the the profile right now the economist has a cover of when will this boom end even though it was a negative article they led with balloons going to the sky so everybody's chasing nvidia everybody's chasing semis they're the last man standing deservedly so and maybe there is no bull industrials market. have done well too though howard you gotta no, give I some credit it. to industrials but the divergences have been there the rates are driving this long term meaning this is seriously a problem but the fomo is raging in a very small sector of the digital economy for good and bad reasons and so there's a lot of misallocated fomo money happening at a time when the public markets and the bond markets are saying you know pay attention so there is a lot going on and you know this is a major moment that could separate people from their money 
um, just as they're feeling comfortable with, they think they know exactly what's going on. Phil, that's right? what I was that's, trying to that's, get at. That's the point of this market is, right, to fool the most amount of people as possible, you know, and, 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 and rug pull at the uh, least opportune times for investors. Right, Perlman? I mean, this is, it's just the same shit over and over and over again. How long have we been doing this? I just want to get in a couple really quick points about what you guys are saying. You're hitting on a lot of the keynotes. Number one, uh, this is speculation that we're seeing in the, you know, in this, in the, you know, the uh, Dogecoin is up 150%. And Shiba Dibu. Shinu, yeah. Shina Ibu and Cumrocket. And it's, it's, it's just Shiba crazy. Shiba Inu. And, and Shiba it's Inu. Lower, Eastman right? Kodak Shina on Ibu, the public side. Shina D-Wack. Easton. Yeah. Right. And, um, and so it's speculation. So there's going to be, so you don't want to, uh, Batnick, our, 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 our homeboy Batnick over at Ritholtz Wealth wrote a post called FOMO um, on his uh, great blog, Irrelevant Investor. You got to go read that if you want to get involved here because it's speculation and it plays with your emotion. You get FOMO, you see your, you know, this guy over here on the internet or this neighbor making all this money and talking big and you get that, you your fear of missing out. And that is a really unhealthy thing. I just want to say one other point. Can you put up that? Can you guys put up that lifetime chart of Bitcoin? It's a log chart. I just want to make one quick comment about this. The thing is here is that, you know, everybody, you know, people who are, are doubters and talking about it being a bubble and it's ridiculous and it's absurd and it's, you know, magic internet money or whatever. This chart shows, uh, the resilience, this log chart shows the resilience of this asset. Over the last 13 years, you've had numerous booms and numerous crashes, and every time it's come up. And I just wanted to say that, you know, this thing looks like it's around, you know, the longer it's around, it's like the Lindy effect or whatever. The longer it's around, the chances are the longer it'll be around. And, you know, the tulip bubble, we have the tulip bubble, and then tulips crash, they never came back. You can buy a dozen tulip bulbs on amazon.com for like six bucks. But this one is just really, really incredible. Uh, JC, you have anything to add about the crashes? And well, then can, coming I, can back? I throw one overlay on there? Kiki yeah. and Jordan, yeah. can you throw up the 2011 Fred Wilson blog post that explains why he was bullish on Bitcoin or something like it? This goes to like, let's be honest, while you're day trading, it's important to find people that are right often about big trends. And if you go read this post, and everybody should, I, I, I link to it today. This post is so simple and precise. If we scroll down to the bottom, Phil, look, 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 look at how he wrote that. This is 2011. Just read that. I'm confident we'll see the emergence of currencies that are not controlled by nation states in my lifetime. Whether that is a good thing or not remains to be seen. I think it is. But there are significant ramifications that will result from the decoupling of currencies from governments. And one of them is an interesting investment opportunity that we hope to participate in. Okay. I mean, Coinbase became that investment. Fred was the investor. <laughs> um, Fred unleashed Ethereum at Stocktoberfest at 30 bucks. People scrambled to buy it. Fred, is, these words are just as relevant in 2000. The only thing that I would say there is Fred's still not potentially sure if Bitcoin, especially with ETFs coming into Bitcoin, if that will be the ultimate winner now, because it's not really a nation, you know, it's not really solving for the nation state. But there you go. Cleanly, clearly explained to the layman in 2011. Yeah, you know, people are still continuing to search for second, 20th, 100th opinions between price and great thesis. Uh, you can spend a lot of time talking yourself out of investments, but these trends can go on for a very long time. Now, people always ask me, they go, Howard, what do you think? And I go, has Fred changed his mind? You know, has Yoni changed his mind? Have the people that have been right from the beginning changed their mind? No, right? Now, has the industry evolved much further? Shit coins, stable coins, uh, the SEC involvement? Yes, right? But the general thesis of what Fred wrote about in 2011 is here. Now, Fred didn't know there'd be a Solana phone and didn't know Solana. He didn't even know Ethereum would be there in 2011, right? But he said it clearly, some other form of the algorithm. And so this is software. This is, there's no earnings calls. This is very different. There's, it's very hard to analyze. 
other than with risk management, I would think, JC. And so why, don't, why don't you throw out the Bitcoin chart so I can exactly show what I'm seeing? And and Perlman, you talked about the tulip bubbles. You know, the tulip had a bubble and came back. And you talk about the long-term chart of Bitcoin. It's gone up, down, up, down. I think mean, didn't Amazon lose 90-something percent of its value, right? Bitcoin's done that a few times. So this is what it looks like to me. to 6. Amazon went from one one thirteen to six in two thousand. Oh, yeah. But 2000. that's driven by a textbook world of cash flows. This is a different, complete. And then, universe. by the way, you know what's really cool when you go in the airport in the Netherlands when you fly into Amsterdam, they got tulips all over in the airport. It's hysterical. Like, like not everybody would walk down there and just laugh at that. But like for me, I can't. Like the irony in the whole thing is just hysterical. Anyway, so they take their tulips very seriously over there, which is very cool. Um, so this is what it looks like to me, you know, right? Mortgage the house against 31, you know, unlimited upside, all those things. Great. It worked. Now what? Well, mission accomplished, right? If, if the target was the former highs, well, here we are making all time highs. The question is, how long is it going to take to absorb this overhead supply? Again, we have the new demand dynamic that wasn't there before with the ETFs, and that could possibly mathematically uh, speed up that process of demand absorbing that supply. That makes sense to me. Now, how long is it going to take? That I can't tell you. Uh, but you start seeing this thing in the 70s, it's gone. Hundreds coming quick. Um, think about this I just chart. don't know how long it's going to take. When you said mortgage the house, or maybe it wasn't even timed correctly, when this was crashing, right, if you, if you had told me we'd be back at 70,000 with rates at 5% and still yeah. rising... So forgetting the so one extra yeah. point, JC, is your rate, your demand thing is dead on. The second thing is there is no accounting for what happens when the Fed has to cut again, which is what Fred talked about in his 2011 thesis. What happens when we have to devalue the currencies for real? Because on top of this Bitcoin chart, we should pull up GLD, which is old Bitcoin. Okay. So what scares me about what's going on right now is gold's confirming Bitcoin, not the other way around, right? Bitcoin was front running gold. Now, gold's, which is a much more latent or slower signal for apocalypse or something going on in the macro, is actually confirming what Bitcoin's doing, right? It's doing what we thought gold should do if Bitcoin didn't exist. And that has me a little concerned. Again, this is part of the eerie market. Rates still high. Governments suck. World sh shrinking borders. Tensions high. Bad leadership. Um, stocks at record valuations, everybody's FOMO, and gold's breaking out. I mean, maybe it means nothing, but I think it means something. I I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't. But I, I don't. Uh, I I don't. I don't know. Uh, what I do know is that if you want to own gold, if it's making new all time highs, own gold. If it's making new all time highs, don't. I did. Own I own gold. some. Like, like I just have like to don't the own gold. Because you like Bitcoin. No. If you like Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin. If you like gold, buy gold. If you like both, yeah. buy both, right? But I, I, I don't, I'm not confident with this is happening together. It might be. I don't know. I just think it's I wouldn't think of it that way. I keep them separate. No, I keep them separate, but I got long because I'm like, that base, if I change the ticker, you know. Right. If it was a software stock in, it was in, in, MMYT, in the MMYT, I'm buying that ticker. Exactly. You know? um, can so you throw, uh, throw the next chart up? But so it here's is, what I think. I'm telling you, Phil, it means something. We're going to look a, here's back a cheat at this code. and it's going to mean something. Here's a cheat code. When precious metals are doing well, you're going to see silver outperforming gold, right? When there's a real trend there in precious metals, you're going to see that outperformance in silver. You haven't seen it right? This would be a really logical level for silver to start outperforming gold. By the way, it outperformed yesterday by like about 160 basis points. Today, it's actually slightly underperforming gold. But if you start to see silver going and the animal spirits, because basically the silver to gold ratio represents the animal spirits in the precious metals market. When you start to see that, you know that that's trending higher. Gold breaking out to an all-time high obviously is a great start. But if, if, you, if you think that that trend's got legs, I think you want to see silver outperforming gold. What's the, what's the, is there like a, is there like a, a construct behind that? Is there like a theory behind that is? Yeah, it's a, just... it's, a, it, it's a higher beta. It's, it's risk on, right? So generally speaking, you know, as, as, as the markets are appreciating, gold's going to underperform because the junkier stuff's going to do better. The junior silver miners and, you know, whatever, you know, scam they got going on in Vancouver and like all those things are just a leveraged bet 
on gold and they're going to outperform gold, right? It's not gold's fault. The shit coins of the yeah, metals. Yeah, the shit coins of the metals, exactly. <laughs> and and same thing on the way down, right? Uh, gold's going to go down. All those things are going to get hammered, right? The scams in Vancouver are going to wind up being scams all along, right? Like, you know, the same thing, same thing. Gold is a defined risk here. It's just one of those trades that just seems you got to put it on because you know where to stop out. And there's it's really could go anywhere at this point. You know? Yeah, you know, for for us, it's been the former highs from last um, the last cycle from 2011. You know, for above, that was about 1940. Above We're that, above you can own as much gold as you want. No, no, we've been above that. That's my <laughs> point. Like, this isn't anything new. We're making new all-time highs. I guess that makes sense. You yeah. know, I think 2,500 is probably next. So the other thing I don't know if we should talk about, Phil, I want to end with some optimism stuff. People, FOMO and optimism. We got to get into, we're going to get into the malevolent seven yeah. too. The FOMO. Remember Perlman, the FOMO I used to be a gold optimism, bug. Good you optimism met me, I was a gold bug. FOMO. But I think you we should You guys know really... that? You guys remember that? Dude, I went on, this is a crazy story, but I went on and it was sheer luck. I sold gold at the top 13 years ago and then went on CNBC and told everybody I was selling gold. <laughs> We were in chains. That's my greatest fucking call ever. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm selling gold. I have no idea what I'm talking about. Anybody who watches this regularly knows that. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm selling gold here. I got my tie on. I'm all uncomfortable. Uh -huh. and I'm, you know, Not as good as me talk. swearing on calling Citibank shitty bank and being banned from, but being banned. Dude, from, you were like on an Octobox yeah. with uh, Kramer wearing my a hard helmet. My head a hard was going hat in or something back in the day. and I was just like trying to it get it. It was so off. absurd. The, the, okay, let's get into let's get into the malevolent seven. No, no, let's no. talk thing, about Phil. I think it's crazy if we don't talk about um JC's call three weeks ago and revisit the divergences and the shit talking of like what's really now been happening the last three weeks, right? Apple breaking down. Again, everybody expects like when someone changes their tone to be right the first hour. Right. We weren't telling people to get short, but we were here three, four weeks ago saying, not talking about crypto, but talking about stocks, saying there were divergences. Right. And everybody fucking flamed us because we changed our mind or said to be careful. So let's look for it. I've seen so many, you know, great run ups, but now cracks, right? Elastic, a lot of my um, snowflake, Apple, GitLab just imploded. Um, uh, Cloudflare broke out, but now trading back in the gap. Um, Datadog, uh, Tesla back at lows. So I'm saying like, there are some serious cracks and maybe this is just the seasonal, like JC said, a seasonal, you know, uh, pullback that refreshes, but like, it's just not that easy out there right now. Right? Like you can wake up one day and your stock's down 20%. Um, no, on the good side, biotechs have been working, um, you know, and the Eli Lilly, like those Empic trades still on and the semi, the semi trade still on, but it's getting thinner. It feels like, even though I'm hearing breath is improving, I hear, I do hear that JC, the breath is actually improving, but yeah, because those are people who, those are people who haven't counted, <laughs> right? They're cherry picking, they're cherry picking a select oscillator that they're just making up that that means that breath is improving we haven't seen breath improve at all in fact um breath continues to deteriorate it feels uh, like, like that the to me it feels hold on like here's the thing me. here's I'm the not thing. counting but i i see breath is deteriorating you could take my word for it because i actually count yeah. we have seen fewer and fewer new highs with every time that the indexes make new highs fewer sectors are participating and tech continues to roll over which is Technology is 30% of the S&P 500. It's 50% of the NASDAQ 100. So tech is a big deal. If you lose tech, that's a big problem for this overall market. So that's how I see it. And you've been losing it. You, small cap tech continues to make new lows on both an absolute and a relative basis. So it's, mm -hmm. it was really only the megas. So that has been front and center. Here's an interesting one. Um, when Roundhill, um, shout out to Roundhill, when they decided to change the name of their ETF to the Magnificent 7 ETF, as opposed to their large cap uh, tech ETF, that was on November the 9th. Since then, you've seen the MAG7 ETF appreciate another 20-something percent. But underneath the surface, one at a time, or, or you're losing them. You lost Tesla. You, lo you lost Apple now, which is fantastic. Best trade I've put on of the year so far. One for the good guys, right? Google, you're losing. That's how this works, right? You start to lose one, one or the other. So... What have we seen? Fewer stocks making new highs. No question, everybody sees it. If you haven't seen it, you haven't been counting. 
What we have not seen is an expansion in stocks making new lows. And that's what I love about math, because it doesn't matter where you think the market's going to go, up or down, we can all agree that you cannot have a correction of any kind mathematically unless the prices of stocks are going down. We can all agree on that. So we count the amount of stocks that are going down, and we just have not seen an expansion in that at all. So that's 10 day good. lows list, one month low list, three month low list, nothing. So, so that's if good. you're going to see a correction, you're going to see the list of stocks making 10 day lows, 30 day lows. You're going to see spikes in that. Haven't seen it. If you start to see that, you know you're in one. Okay. Thank you. Good. So I just, w I just want to talk about the breadth of this chart, right? Because I do think, I mean, Invi great take. And NVIDIA has really, you know, you, you look at that 22%. What percentage? And by the way, November 9th was two weeks after the October 26th bottom. So the market bottomed like crazy. It's the end of the world. QQQ is up 100 points from that bottom in October 26th. And Apple and Tesla are flat to down over that same period of time. And what you're really seeing here in this Magnificent Seven, or now maybe Malevolent Seven, is NVIDIA and Microsoft really holding the whole mm, thing up. It's more NVIDIA and Facebook or Meta. Well, NVIDIA, let's not forget, Meta. NVIDIA NVIDIA is only 3% of the S&P 500. Just keep that in mind. No, but it's probably a huge percentage of the Qs. Um, no, it's actually not that big. It, NVIDIA no, but of the, is only of the Magnificent four, Seven. Of the Mag of the Seven, Qs. though, NVIDIA and Meta are a of big your, part of Of it. your chart. Of the mags, NVIDIA is 7%. That's big. Oh, okay. Oh, so no, even that big. is fairly small. Yeah. I mean, I mean but it's up huge small. in that period. So it's Meta yeah. has helped. Amazon has helped. But it's not but NVIDIA. Seeing, well, over, even you're, Microsoft's off 3% today. It's just the internals. It's just the internals of the market. They haven't gotten worse. They've just been getting less and less good. Now, okay. you have to get less and less good before you get worse, right? That's how that works. But we haven't seen mm. it get worse yet. If you start to see the 10-day lows, 21-day lows, 30-day lows, you start to see spikes in those, you know you're in a correction. Okay. I like it. So that's the check-in from three weeks ago. You know, people misconstrue us getting nervous or calling out some short ideas with us becoming bearish. There's no reason. It's, a, it's the American way. Short stocks. Let's go. <laughs> Apple to zero. Who cares? Hey, uh, Howard, did you, have any com <laughs> did you have any comment? No, well, I, I mean, it's a beautiful thing that you're saying because investing is, uh, should not be a fan club. Like, and you get these people who are just fans of certain stocks they're perma, whatever. They're also just trolling. They're, great investing is art and math, period. It's a beautiful science because you can apply both, right? Depending on how your risk management is. But there's an art to pattern recognition and there's math that, that helps people that are good outperform over time. It's a combo. You know, there's great artists, there's great mathematicians. And then there's people that combine both and probably harder to do just to do the com combination. I think the math people... And the pure art people uh, probably are the most interesting because it's simpler. But the math and art is a fun way to do it, too. Go ahead. Com no. Combining the two themes that we've talked about today, talking about the crypto and talking about the Mag 7 or the possibly the Malevolent 7. Uh, any thoughts, Howard? I thought you had some thoughts on micro strategy versus Apple here. Well, I just think there. it's and JC the, had the, the troll chart of all time. Look at this guy. The guy has been absolutely pounding the table you know very different than a fred wilson or a pomp or any of the people or mr wonderful this fucking guy has put his nuts on the line right all in this. let's go like, like this okay. Size and he's of done it in a way that's really entertaining to his fans which is how you create a cult Right, you go all in. You create a call. We've seen it with I Omega and the Motley Fool crowd. We've seen it with Qualcomm. We've seen it a thousand times. Phil, you and I and JC, not as old. This is a fascinating troll. So walk me through what we're seeing here, JC. Well, it's not a troll. Like I'm no, not I mean, trolling it's, it's anything. Fact, but like, like the way you're expressing I mean, it is hilarious. Why? Because I, I'm. I mean, listen. I'm obviously. I guess. I guess I have this trade on, right? Because we've been long Bitcoin and short Apple. So technically, I guess 
I've been in this trade, correct? Um, which is probably but why the best I, I way to play it would have been micro, long micro strategy calls in short. Yeah, well, I'm not in, long micro strategies. We've just been I'm in saying, Bitcoin and crypto thing, straight and short up vertical. Apple, so straight up vertical. Yeah, I mean, listen, this chart doesn't. It's just sort of a a visualization of what has transpired over the last several months. That's all. And and so what right? I'm saying, Phil, Michael Saylor is the definition of however he came to his conclusion. He is. All in. That's a strategy. I mean, God He's bless. all in and Why he you're did be not a billionaire? lose. You want to be a billionaire? You can do it the, there's many ways. You can do it the Warren Buffett way of very 40 years. Your your wealth starts accumulating in your 60s, the compounding. Or you're Michael Saylor and you go, I was a billionaire once. Here's how I become it again. All in on an asset that I feel I have insights that no one else has. Tune out the noise. Um, and he had his thesis, maybe he read Fred Wilson's blog post in 2011 and said, there's nothing else to read. And, um, he's right. He's borrowing money <laughs> in his company. He's borrowing fiat, what they call, you know, fiat money. He's borrowing mm. us dollars, dollars and then buying Bitcoin. And he's doing it when it goes up and he's doing it. No, when but it goes he's not down. just borrowing. He's issuing, he's issuing secondaries on the stock to raise money. Right. He's selling equity. To yeah. raise money to buy Bitcoin. It's genius. This Unbelievable. Thing, it's, it's like balls like this. Wouldn't probably probably wouldn't like the guy in person hanging out with him, but I'm rooting for him. I'm not I don't know who I'm rooting for. I'm just saying, wow. Wow. I'm just saying, wow. I'm always impressed when stuff happens that I can't get my head around and it plays out, you know, it's it's all of yeah, a but sudden. You know what, Perlman? This has been going on for years. This trade has well, been going on for years Perlman. and now he's having his moment. Perlman, this is I think there's a lot of sailor, you know, Perlman would appreciate. Like, when, I don't know if you know what he does during the day. What he does during the day, he gets up, he exercises, and then he spends the rest of his day talking about Bitcoin, getting people to buy a Bitcoin. Then he wakes up the next day, he exercises in the morning, and he spends the day telling people the simplicity and, and I mean, that's like not yoga. an unhealthy way to live, you it's know? like yoga. It's crypto yoga. And he puts his money where his mouth is. And well, he's putting his, you, know, you appreciate, money where his right? You appreciate that. It's pretty that genius. Pearls, he's putting you know? other people's yeah. money where his Ro mouth is. Rooting for him like crazy. Because it really rooting. is like in this world where everybody is like, which way is the wind blowing? That's what I'm thinking. He's exactly the opposite. No, but Good he's times the poster child of my degenerate economy. He's a, he's a billionaire that is acting like a degenerate. But he, I, he, I don't think he thinks he's being a degenerate. I didn't I say. I'm not he's saying being very responsible. <laughs> Hang on. I'm speaking to the subject in New York this week at a sports conference. I have no sports expertise. I'm, the degenerate economy theme has taken off on its own. You play it's golf. Like You're a good golfer. That's a sport, bro. No, it's like I'm as good at golf as yeah. I am at venture capital. I don't know when I, I don't know anything about tech. So, so my point is, the degenerate economy is not a den. Is I'm not. I'm not being mean. It's like stock twits. I'm saying there is no difference anymore. It's an art. The art of degeneracy is here to stay. People practice it all day. People practice it for five minutes a day. There's no, there's just pick your poison of how you want to be a degenerate because it's around DraftKings to stock twits to Reddit to Robinhood to Coinbase to MicroStrategy to, to uh, shit coins to crypto punks. Um, free time, great technology. Um, but in the real world, Borders are shrinking, interest rates are high, uh, FOMO is high, divergences exist, and it's it's a weird market, and there's a lot of wacky stock behavior. So I think you know that's kind By of. By the good. way, you know, as we as we talk, you know, the queues are where they were almost a month ago. Right. And so I mean, you, you know, probably can. The there's a lot more breakdowns made... and breakouts. So Phil, on the optimism side, you had a great post, right? Of how to be optimistic because we're optimistic. Yeah. Here. So I just so so Jenna Bland, who's a great uh, great journalist and editor in chief at uh, Pension Investments, she sent me a DM the other day, and she was just like, "How do you stay so optimistic in this you know in this world that we're living in?" And so I didn't really think about it. I just responded to her, and I just wanted to talk about. Briefly, number one, I got four things for you. Number one, stay mindful of your own mortality. So like we're all going to die and that sounds like such a terrible thing, but really 
you could put a spin on it where it's a really optimistic thing. Yeah. Because if you know you have a limited time here, you might as well make the best of it. You might as well have a little fun. You might as well spend time with people you enjoy, people you love. You, may as, you might as well feel great. Go out and take a run if it makes you feel good or eat a really good meal. So you might as well enjoy your life because it's only lasting for so long. Like the ride's going to be over. That's number one. Number two, you want to be healthy, right? You want to maintain, get yourself into really good shape, strong metabolic health. And what that really means is you want to get your body weight to a place where you're well, a healthy body weight. That's like 80% of it. I mean, metabolic health, I'm not going to get all into like definitions of that and the blood work and all that, but you want to get yourself healthy because you enjoy life more and you have it affects your mood. We know that for a fact. Brain Energy, Chris Palmer is a great book. He's a Harvard psychiatrist. And basically he says that if you have good, strong metabolic health, if you're a healthy person, if you're sleeping well, if you're eating well, if you're exercising, you're getting your body weight right, that your mood improves, that your mental health improves, you feel better, you feel better, you're, you experience more joy, all of the good things. So that's number two. Number three, you want to practice. You know, this is an intentional thing where you can practice optimism, where you could say, okay, okay, there's this glass here and I'm going to think about how I can view it as half full. And I'm just going to like intentionally say, well, you know, there's coffee in there and it's a little more than half full. So I'm going to view it as half full. So there's an intentional cognitive thing of how you, how you look at things, right? For uh, another example is, you know, somebody was commenting about losing their job and like, okay, maybe that's, maybe that the first reaction to that's going to be really negative. But the second reaction could be, hey, this is an opportunity for me to go out and get something better that I might enjoy more. I didn't like that job anyway. And so there's a cognitive aspect. And then the fourth and possibly most important is family, community, and love is surrounding yourself with people that you care about, that you want to be invested in, that you want to be with, and then being with them and spending that time, uh, that valuable time, that valuable limited time you have of being with the people that you really care about. And that brings us full circle because this is Trends with Friends and I'm here with JC and Howard, my, my boys. And it, today, and that's great, Phil, because I agree with all this, but it comes later in my life. Look at Richard Lewis, the top of his game passed away. He was, they did a moment of silence for him and he had his killer moment. Even he looked terrible, right? Just episode five of season 12. Um, you know, I was reading the story about him and he, he was, him and Larry Day went to summer camp together, used to get in fist fights. And then they became best friends and they're fucking in their 70s doing peak comedy on Curb Your Enthusiasm. Now, Richard looked terrible, but he crushed it in this last episode. Like he's since passed from making this episode, but he was at an AA meeting doing a fucking bits. And he's becomes, he just wants to do his next show from an AA meeting because he's crushing it at this AA meeting. <laughs> and Larry and him are just bantering about like, that's a pretty good idea, right? And all these people are coming up to him at the AA meeting and like, dude, you killed it today. <laughs> you know, it was just, and he looked like walking death and he was only 76, right? And he's at the top of his game and he's gone. So I think when I read your post, I'm like, guys, there's FOMO and there's money. But the four points of that optimism, the sooner you can kind of get on that track, which is not easy, uh, the better. Because really it comes down to those four things. And and being long Bitcoin. And by All the right, way, boys. you can you can be you can be optimistic and still short the shit out of this market. Like understand your time horizon as an investor. Who are you? Why are you here? What is the time horizon? What are your goals with that money? What is your risk tolerance? How much are you willing to lose in the off chance that you get it wrong? Like, that's really important for investors to remember. Like, you know, I'm a very optimistic person, but, you know, I hope the market goes to zero. You know? But, like, yeah, you know, but like, we want guests on the Nothing personal, right? <laughs> no, but it's like having personal. Freck on or <laughs> with direct indexing. It's finding big trends. You only have to find white. For MicroStrategy, he's done a few because he's obviously a bright guy. For Fred Wilson, the same blog post he wrote in 2011, if you'd stumbled upon it and knew who he was and understood who you were following, you didn't have to do much. You just had to check in with Fred every year and go, what are you doing? And there's people out there that move markets and there's trends out there that are starting uh, all the time. So I think the quieter 
the, the more you work on the right type of optimism, the, the better frame of mind you will be for that one trend that you can ride uh, to change your life. I mean, there, there's going to be a hundred coming out of this new weird market that we're, we're in. The AI stuff is just starting. Um, crypto is really just starting, right? Uh, te so. Technology is 30% of the S&P 500. Energy is three. Yeah, so energy might be the trade too. So, all right, and hybrids, hybrid over, um, hybrid motors working, so oil's, oil's back in play. So 30% right. technology, 3% energy. You think that stays like that? I'll take the under. Interesting. All right, we'll check back in on that every month. Uh, boys, we'll see you next week. I'm in New York. Uh, see you guys next week. Adios.